Okay, and we are now live and I can see people coming into the room. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to hang tight for the next minute or two while the room fills up with our attendees. Thank you so much for joining. And I want to know where people are joining us from. So I am going to go ahead and ask you guys to just drop that in the chat. Hello, Data Bees. Thanks for being here today. Where's everyone joining from? I'm in the Bay Area. We have a number of uh, people from IBM joining, our former IBM, our, our friend C. Mohan, who was an IBM fellow who just retired, I uh, see, and, uh, and a whole lot of other people. Awesome. Okay, Bay Area, Columbia. Silver Spring, Saratoga, Los Angeles, woo, Yale. All right, cool, great, Santa Clara, awesome. This is all awesome, guys. So glad to see where everyone is joining us from. Uh, we're gonna just give it one more minute, kind of let the room fill up, and then I'm gonna really briefly kind of go over the ground rules for how today's webinar is gonna work. Uh, and then we're gonna just talk for one or two minutes about what the Hive Think Tank does, invite you to our future events, before we turn this over to these fine gentlemen, TM Ravi and Joel Burn Burnham. So we're really excited for today and we're really glad that you're here. And I can see that there's still people coming in. Awesome. Los Gatos, Bay Area, Napa, lots of Californians. And Joel, lots of colleagues from HP, Dominic Orr, uh, Jeff Morgan, uh, Fred Luis, uh, amazing turnout. Ruby Lee, my friend Ruby Lee. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm going to have to be careful what I say. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, great. So I think we can kind of go ahead and get started, Robbie. Do you mind okay. just pulling wait, up? Wait, wait a second. Oh, all right, go ahead. Okay. Um, where I'm just really briefly, Joel, you can still kind of have time to adjust. I'm going to just kind of go over the ground rules for today's webinar with our attendees. So thank you all for joining us today. Welcome to the Hive Data Think Tank webinar series. We've got an awesome uh, conversation today. We're gonna be discussing the one, the only, Joel Burn Burnham and Legends of Technology. So we're really excited. We hope you're really excited. Um, my name is Maddie Watt. I'm the Senior Manager of People and Programs at the Hive. First, I'm gonna really quickly go over the ground rules and then I'm gonna again explain what the Hive Think Tank does and then I'm gonna pass the virtual microphone over to these fine gentlemen. So chat rules, we love questions. Please use the Q&A button. There's gonna be a button at the bottom of your screen. Um, that's Q&A, so please ask your questions for Joel through there. And we're gonna be trying something really cool and exciting this time. Uh, we're gonna be calling on individuals that the questions that we like, and I'm gonna enable you to speak via voice. So um, if you hear your name and, and I enable you, please go ahead and ask your question for Joel live. But we do need you to go ahead and record it um, in the actual Q&A feature. So please use that Q&A button. Uh, please be respectful in the chat and, and refrain from product plugs. This is not the place or time to be recruiting for your startup and we appreciate your understanding. This session is being recorded and will be available to view later on the Hive's YouTube channel. I'll go ahead and drop the link for that in the chat. Uh, we love when people follow along and contribute on social media. If you're gonna do that, please use the hashtag HiveData or tag us at HiveData. And lastly, at the very end of today's conversation, I'm gonna send out a very brief five question event feedback survey. This helps us design the events specifically tailored to what you guys wanna see. So we really appreciate if you just take the two seconds to fill that out. So without further ado, I'm going to jump into what we're doing at the Hive Think Tank and then we're gonna get started here. Awesome, so the Hive Think Tank is an ecosystem of entrepreneurs, corporations, and thought leaders. We are bringing you guys events from Silicon Valley basically every week since the start of uh, the pandemic. We hope everyone is staying healthy and safe um, and you can always find out what we're doing if you go to www.hivedata.com and click on the Hive Think Tank. And I will go ahead and drop that link in the chat. Next slide, please, Ravi. We want to do a special thank you to our sponsors, including Avanta Ventures, Tipco, SAP, IBM, Verizon, and Intuit. Uh, if you are interested in becoming a sponsor of the Hive Think Tank, or if you're interested in doing an event with us, please go ahead and contact me, 
maddie at hivedata.com. So this is what we've got coming up for you guys. Next week, we are uh, kicking off our three-part series on healthcare and data. Um, and the first one is gonna be about driving affordability in healthcare with data and AI. We have an amazing panel for you guys. I'm gonna drop the registration link for this in the chat, so don't worry. Thanks, Ravi. And then uh, the following week on August 19th, we have um, remote operations and intelligent asset solutions in oil and gas. This is gonna be all about how the field of oil and gas is changing because of data and what sort of uh, AI principles are being utilized in the field today. I'll go ahead and drop that link too. And then lastly, uh, we are doing uh, COVID testing on the CDC and FDA guidelines. Uh, that's going to be on Wednesday the 26th at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Um, and the first, the first event that I mentioned, that was on, that's going to be next Thursday at 11 a.m. So we usually are on Wednesdays or Thursdays at 11 a.m., except there's one more event. Ravi, next slide. And that's going to be this really cool, interesting, sustainable fashion with data-powered platforms. That's actually going to be at 9 a.m. Pacific time. So if you want to go ahead and sign up for these, I'll be dropping the links. Um, and we really are looking forward to seeing you guys. So thanks so much for joining us. And without further ado, Ravi and Joel, let's hear it. Thank you. So um, um, just if I may add about this event, uh, so Odil Rujol, who used to be president of Longcomb and the chief data officer of, of uh, Orange, is an advisor to the Hive. So we're very pleased to, to support uh, her. So just a brief introduction to the Hive. The Hive is a venture capital and a, and a company creation studio, very focused on leveraging AI to drive transformation, to drive disruption in the enterprise. And you'll see that we are very thematic in our focus. So we uh, leverage a variety of data-oriented uh, uh, technologies to, to drive value, drive change around these thematic areas, uh, focused in the enterprise and a few key vertical segments. So I'm uh, especially personally pleased to, to be hosting the event today uh, with uh, Joel Birnbaum. So many of you here have worked with Joel in the past. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my own history uh, with, with Joel, but Joel did his uh, bachelor's at, uh, in physics at Cornell, did his PhD in nuclear physics at Yale, uh, joined IBM research and uh, uh, TJ Watson, and we'll we'll find out why he, he did that, and and uh, spent a number of years, 15 years at IBM, and and then in an, an interesting move moved to Hewlett Packard, which was largely uh, instruments and uh, a variety of different businesses, but not really well known as a computer company at that. And, and so he uh, spent a number of years at, at Hewlett Packard, was senior vice president, uh, 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 head of HP Labs, you know, really just drove a number of important sort of uh, uh, contributions in, uh, in, in technology. Many of you, uh, uh, of course, are, are familiar with uh, risk and, and, and uh, PA risk at HP and 801 before at IBM, uh, but around pervasive computing, around um, real-time capture, analysis, control, analysis of, of data, a variety of different things. You know, uh, Joel has, has had a, a number of honors. I won't do justice to all of them. I'll just mention a few. So he was elected to the National Academy, Academy of Engineering, the Royal Academy of Engineering in, in UK, Fellow of the ACM, Fellow of IEEE, Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Sterling Fellow from Yale. He's received an honorary doctorate from Technion. And, and just the contributions that um, uh, Joel has, has had in the computer industry have, 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 have just been uh, uh, amazing. So with that, Joel, I'd like to welcome you to the Hive Think Tank. Thank you. And, and my interaction with Joel and a number of people are there today 
um, from um, many of my former colleagues was that I, I got a, a chance to work for Joel at Hewlett Packard and, and we were doing client server in the information architecture group. But I also, much of my PhD was funded by IBM where, where Joel was uh, head of computer science. So Joel, maybe we get started just from your um, uh, early, early life. You know, you, you did your PhD, you were trained as a kind of nuclear physicist. And, and how did you get into computer science? What, what, what kind of brought you to, to this area? Well, my father had made sure that by the time I uh, finished high school, I had decided to be a scientist or an engineer. I had trouble deciding which I wanted to be. I saw a guidance counselor and he made the interesting suggestion that I choose a school that offered a program in engineering physics, which would enable me to get the basic training in both and be further decision for later. I chose Cornell. Uh, and while there, I decided that I would specialize in physics for the last two years of what was then a five-year program. I took a very influential course in my junior year offered by Richard Conway, whom many of you know. Uh, it was an introduc introduction to programming on a Burroughs machine, one of the few courses offered at that time. And I fell in love with programming to the degree that I got a job that summer and the following summer as a systems programmer in the IBM Center in New York. That consisted of many, many sessions on the machines in Poughkeepsie late at night, working on the innards of operating systems and compilers and so forth. I got to Yale. Uh, I would, had started as a theoretical physicist, but I quickly switched to experimental. My mentor was uh, and thesis advisor and lifelong friend was Alan Bromley, became very famous, later became science advisor to President, uh, first President Bush. Alan was always at the cutting edge of technology, and uh, he had a machine called the multi-parameter analyzer, the only one in the world, which gathered data during the experiment and stored it on a tape. The question was how to analyze it, and I spent a lot of time, since I was the only one there that knew how to program, developing a whole system of software that uh, was used by about half a dozen graduate students and a number of faculty people. I wrote my thesis, and um, uh, Bromley was smart enough that he encouraged me not to do what the students usually did in the summer, but to keep working for IBM as a systems programmer. So I did that every summer and kind of taught myself computer science, sort of, or at least enough to, to know how to write systems programs. And then uh, an opportunity came along because Yale was given the first and largest tandem Van de Graaff accelerator in the world, and Bromley wanted to automate it with the most advanced data acquisition and control system. Uh, and he approached IBM about doing a joint project. They hired me, but assigned me to Yale to run that project. I hired a very small but extremely talented team. They gave us a 360-44, then the fastest and most uh, IO uh, aggressive machine I, IBM made. We modified it. We rewrote the manned operating laboratory from, space, from NASA operating system. I wrote a Fortran preprocessor that produced a language that I thought was elegant and beautiful that enabled people to uh, specify what they wanted. The system was uh, able to um, present data in real time on a 3D display that we designed and developed using A to D converters and many other pieces of specialized instrumentation. The main thing about this was that it enabled you to examine the experiment as it was going on, to compare it to theory, to make sure that the data were good by looking at them, let's say, in the center of mass coordinates instead of just as, as flashes or numbers on a screen. In addition to all that, it uh, controlled the accelerator. So this system was, uh, I thought, elegant and beautiful, and I loved it. Uh, Everyone that I knew, including all the nuclear physicists, loathed it. They hated it, and I think they hated me also because I liked it so much. They thought it was unreliable, arbitrary, unfriendly. Uh, they just hated that it was a necessary tool and they wished that it would just evaporate. It was my first exposure to the enormous difference between a computer person and a technical, very smart person but someone who doesn't want to have to know how things work. And it got me thinking about how we might build user interfaces that would be accessible to ordinary people to do the jobs they wanted done, 
without having to know the innards of the machine that was doing it. Anyway, the, the thing was very successful. It lasted three years. It turned into a bunch of IBM products, which were sold to other, other nuclear centers. Um, everybody got corporate awards, et cetera, et cetera. And um, as a result of it, because the next job was um, automation of the new tandem van de Graaff, uh, not the machine, and, uh, you know, what, what was I going to do next? So it turned out that Yale, um, being uh, eager to have somebody that could keep up the computer system, offered me a faculty position. And IBM said, why don't you come back and expand what you did to fields other than physics? I decided to go back to physics because I love the elegance of the computers and I dislike the messiness of the experiments, which always seemed to fail uh, whenever I was involved. So uh, with some reluctance, after a while, I left uh, computing. And that was how I found myself back at the IBM Research Center in the late 60s. And, and uh, as, as you kind of came from Yale to, to IBM, you know, you, you started kind of, um, tell us kind of the journey of kind of how you, you, you got to IBM Research and how sort of the whole risk computing kind of uh, concept came about. Okay, I'm going to say some things I've never said before publicly. I, I'm old enough now, I'm not too worried about it. Um, <laughs> Go for it, Joel. <laughs> uh, when I got there, I was made the manager of real-time systems for time-shared lab automation, and we did some really interesting things. Uh, most of the Yale team came with me, and um, we automated, for example, an electron microscope. Uh, it had never been done before, and then we did an X-ray crystallographer, a uh, crystallography machine. We did timeshare data acquisition on a lot of measured computer systems. We instrumented a computer so that we could see in much more detail than had probably ever been seen before exactly what was going on as it executed its uh, instructions. I also had projects that were involved with the Cambridge Address Translator developed at our Science Center in Boston, which was the first virtual memory machine. We later generalized that to become the first virtual machine. And VM, of course, later came out of that, although I wasn't personally involved in that. But I also started a lot of work on the user interfaces to try to create this transparency so that not everybody would hate computers. We did a thing called the speech filing system using cognitive psychologists, and they, in fact, that in fact became the world's first voicemailing system, something I don't like to admit to publicly. Uh, it, um, Moshe Zluf and his colleagues started Query by Example, one of the first and by far the most successful non-procedural uh, languages that enabled ordinary people to construct very uh, difficult uh, jobs. Uh, but most importantly for me, I inherited a project from someone who had left called the Modular Computer System, which was a set of loosely coupled uh, IBM mini computers. Uh, it wasn't a particularly wonderful design, but it began my interest in distributed systems, and we began thinking about ways that we could tightly couple them, how we could make them more useful, how, in fact, a collection of machines could, in fact, do many things uh, in an easier, more natural, and perhaps someday even faster way than the mainframes and time sharing that we were using. So things were going along very nicely until 1971. And in 1971, the L.M. Ericsson Company of Sweden, one of the world's leading telephone companies, secretly approached the management, the top management of IBM, to uh, suggest that perhaps the combination of the two could build a family of telephone, digital telephony systems that could rival uh, AT&T, which had just come out with the uh, world's largest digital switch, the ESS4. And uh, would we like to investigate what such a new business venture would be, although it would have to be done in secret, as it was. So uh, separate task forces were formed, legal, business, and uh, technical. I was asked, because I knew a lot about real-time computing, and I'd been doing all this distributed stu stuff and so on, to head the technical team. And to, they gave me carte blanche in the IBM Corporation and quite a number of slots to hire the people to help me do this, although it had to be done in secret. I reported directly to the vice chairman of the board and to Ralph Gomery, who was then the director of research, and was not allowed to tell people what I was doing. Uh, of course, John Koch, Maurice Carnot, a guy named Alan Tritter, a telephone genius from Bell Labs, who was the guy who caught Captain Crunch, if any of you remember who he was, um, many PBX experts and so forth got together, and we started thinking about how you could build a machine that would rival AT&T's. 
after a three month team, each team, each company had such teams, they worked separately. And we convened secretly, checking in at a back door at Claridge's Hotel in London for the meeting at which each team would present what it had come up to with, and the executive would decide what combination or which one he should use and how we could proceed. So I made the presentation for the, H, for the IBM solution, which uh, of course included John Cox's notions of a very fast, highly specialized controller for the switch, which used the principles first enunciated by Seymour Cray and others many years before, load store architecture, um, simple instruction set, uh, all instructions executed in a single cycle, no microcode, so it could scale because scalability was the key issue so that you could use the system uh, without change in software on both the great big digital switches, but also on remote concentrators, PBXs, and so forth. We made our presence, they made theirs. Everybody sat back. Um, we'd taken it really seriously and had thrown everything we could at it. Uh, we worked pretty much seven days a week for the three months. Uh, and everybody said, gee, the IBM solution uh, is way, way, way more advanced. We'll take the IBM solution. The business guys spent a number of hours discussing it. And sometime around midnight, everybody said, okay, it's a go. There'll be a new company. Let's get together, have a champagne breakfast, and sign the papers. So we all went to sleep feeling great. But when we got to the breakfast, the head of the LM Erickson delegation, who was Marcus Wallenberg, chairman of the board, said, nope, change my mind. We're not going to do it. If this is what you guys can do in three months, we don't stand a chance. And within a few years, you'll just swallow Erickson, and there'll be nothing left. So we're not going to do it. Well, this was quite a shock. We got on the plane and came home, had a couple of meetings. And then IBM said, well, what the hell do we need him for anyway? Let's do it ourselves." And so a new effort was formed across IBM divisions. I was put in charge of it. Many, many slots of different types to form a separate new telephone company that would be called the IBM telephone company. Well, we worked four years on it. The switch controller uh, was the first risk machine, uh, at least in modern terms. We didn't call it a risk machine. In fact, it was not our intent at all to reduce the instruction set. It was a reduced complexity machine. The idea for scalability was to include only those instructions that could be executed in a single cycle and an enormous reliance on global optimization to write compilers that could compose those simple instructions into the longer, longer ones. The, um, we worried about security, we worried about robustness, fault tolerance. We figured out unique ways of doing things that called gyrate, digital gyrators, which did some of the signal processing. And um, it was um, very successful. We had a terrific design. Uh, we prototyped parts of it. And we once again went to the IBM management for approval. And they said, Nice work, Sonny. Um, give everybody an award, but this is too risky. It takes too long to realize a profit. And in fact, one of the gentlemen that I, since he's passed away, I'll allow to remain unnamed said, what the hell would I want you to work on something that I'll be retired for before it's finished? Well, that was the end of that. Uh, then as we were leaving the room, they said, oh, by the way, no technical publications, please. We'll keep all this stuff on the shelf and take such a turnout that we ever need it. So all of that work, and it was some very good work, uh, remained completely hidden from everybody. Uh, back at IBM Research, uh, we decided that that was not the end that we wanted. And uh, that's what led to the 801, which was the turning of that controller and a lot of the subsystems from the telephone exchange into general purpose system. With, with John Cock, uh, uh, I guess, driving that effort. John, John Cock was the genius behind the machine, smartest man I've ever known, most creative man I've ever known, my best friend at IBM for many, many years. I was theoretically his manager, but if you believe that, I have a bridge that I'd like to sell you also. And uh, John, for those of you that know him, was uh, good at everything. Uh, he, he, his hand was everywhere, and um, we had many, many other talented people, and we acquired many more besides. Um, but uh, really, this was John's, John's project, 
I was its manager. And um, so I guess that's what I wanted to say about that. And, and on the 801, you know, like a lot of things um, at IBM, they just, um, you know, they didn't, they didn't kind of get it out there in, uh, uh, with conviction and, and just go out there uh, and try to dominate the market. Um, what took for so long? Yes, okay. Next set of things I haven't talked about a lot in all these years. Um, we decided to go ahead. We uh, thought that an easy target to go after, first of all, was IBM System 3 mini computer, which had come out recently, it was not particularly exciting. 16-bit machine, not too fast, conventional architecture, uh, couldn't compete with the VAXs, for, for example. And uh, the object was created significantly better. We knew it had to be at least three, four, five times better in cost performance, performance, uh, scalability, et cetera. Um, shortly after that, uh, I got promoted to be the director of computer science. I was no longer the project of the uh, manager of the other one. The new manager was George Radin, wonderfully smart and creative man who had been the uh, an IBM fellow who had uh, invented and produced PL1. For this project, we produced something called PL.8 because it was not quite PL1, but it had a lot of the characteristics of it as a demonstration of what we could do. Uh, we worked four years. We developed a scalable processor, fiber optic IO, Frank Caruba, uh, and so forth. A big trial was set up in which we ran the same benchmark against the system three. I don't remember the numbers, but my recollection is that we beat them by a factor of 10 and everything. The IBM managers looked at it and they said, nice work, Sonny. Here's some awards. And um, I think we'll stick with what we've got. Okay. I uh, was really devastated by this, but we set the team or such of it as didn't quit to, um, to work, trying to see if we could make a scalable engine out of the 801, not a general purpose computer, but something to replace place the microcode in system 370, and that way we would not have to rewrite it for each machine and we could use it across the line and so forth. And that was about the state of things. Um, meanwhile, um, IBM didn't do anything with the 801, uh, and they said that if we could get a sponsor, it could be done, and I guess eventually, I wasn't involved in this, they got the Office Products Division to become a sponsor, and they made a very stripped down version of it to use in a spelling check around a typewriter. And then it was used, uh, I think, in something called the ROMP microprocessor. But it wasn't until uh, the late 80s that IBM really took the technology and took it seriously and came out with the very lovely sets of machines that they used then, and which I think they still probably have some of now. I don't really know. So um, just before I, I kind of switch over to kind of your, your HP sort of um, uh, career, just just as director of computer science at, at, um, at uh, IBM uh, and TJ Watson, any other sort of uh, outside of 801 and risk, any other sort of um, uh, big projects that you were especially proud of? Oh yeah, we had a lot of great things. One of the things that I did was uh, we started a systems performance lab. I, I convinced the company to give me a big IBM 370 I need to use my guinea pig. They've never done that before. So our machine, it didn't do work for anybody. And we instrumented the hell out of it. We surrounded it with all sorts of wonderful performance analysis people. Uh, we had a great performance tools group, uh, Don Fraser, Rasashi Kobayashi, et cetera. And um, we uh, really, really learned huge amounts about the execution of the important benchmarks on machines. Uh, we did a lot of user interface studies, large efforts in speech recognition. In fact, I had a couple of competing efforts, one using um, Bayesian approach, and another one uh, eventually spun out and became Dragon Systems, query by example, uh, which I thought was a brilliant uh, part of the automatic programming activity. Um, many unique act, neat type of processors, a signal processor designed by uh, Abe Pellet and others which used uh, uh, signed canonical digit code uh, ar arithmetic, um, was built secretly for the Navy. In the process, we in the math department and uh, Jim Cooley of Cooley Tukey fame invented the digital Fourier transform, which is used all over the place. Um, we started the robotics activity, which led to uh, 
watch by procedure and eventually the first industrial painting robots that IBM made. Um, a project in dynamic signature recognition, uh, a cryptography group, which uh, eventually developed the block uh, codes, which led to uh, IBM, that became DES, uh, done by uh, Horst Weistel, that group, another IBM fellow. Many theory projects by many people whose names you know. The department kept growing. I got most of the growth at, at Yorktown, uh, again, to the displeasure of most of my colleagues. It got to be about 500 uh, professionals, which is about the size of, at that time of about 20 to 30 computer science departments. It kind of dominated a, large parts of the computer literature. Uh, and that didn't count the very distinguished 100 person math department that did linguistics uh, and theory and many other things. So it was a just wonderful place to work. Wonderful. And, and you know, you were, you were on top of your career at IBM. IBM was on top of the world leading kind of the computer industry. And, and, and then you kind of uh, decided to go to a calculator company, or a, let's say an instrument company. Uh, how did that happen? Oh, I was struck by lightning, didn't you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I love people think, but Did people think you were crazy doing that? <laughs> yeah, they did think I was crazy. Um, I, sometimes I thought I was crazy. Um, I loved working at IBM, the support, the management, uh, resources, the physical environment, was just superb. I, I, the collection of talent, anywhere you turned, and I, I haven't even mentioned the physics and technology and mm -hmm. chip designers and all that, just overwhelming. But I had three or four very difficult projects that had succeeded and others that I haven't talked about, and not a single one of them ever uh, transitioned to the market. Um, the lab was great when I got there, it was still great. I didn't think I'd made any particular difference except, um, you know, maybe helping people to choose good projects to work on. Uh, I, I just um, liked it, but I felt really lousy. And when some of these big multi-year efforts failed, uh, even though they had succeeded technically, I started feeling like a demagogue, that someone who had affected people's lives and marriages and careers, and in some cases, even their health, and then would say, gee, sorry, uh, here's a new stock option. Uh, let, let's get on. What, what are we going to do next? And uh, I, in spite of that, I was approached by a lot of people to join a startup or to join a different company. And I, I never took them seriously. I, I liked IBM. They treated me very well. I loved the people that I worked with. But after the 801 experience, I, I just really was sick of the whole thing. And by coincidence, an HP recruiter called me up. And um, he suggested a trip to San Francisco, to California. And he told me that um, HP had a really difficult problem. I was debating whether to accept him when I was told after giving a talk where I talked about the power that was likely to come of distributed processing, of measurement devices on networks, of intuitive instruments, that would get their intelligence someday through a global information utility that I hoped would someday grow out of the ARPANET. And I was called in and said, we are a time-sharing mainframe pro company, and you are never to give that talk again, and you are not to discuss that thing. I was also told that uh, AI was genuine, artificial intelligence was genuine stupidity, so would I please stop all of those projects? Uh, well, I didn't stop them, I just renamed them. I called them expert systems and nobody caught on for quite a bit of time. But in any case, um, that was it. I decided to come to California. Uh, and when I got there, I, I wasn't really particularly serious about it. Um, HP was under $3 billion, as you said, it was calculators and a few random scanned computers. Uh, on the chart that showed the computer industry, H, uh, IBM occupied something like three quarters of it. There were seven or eight other com companies that made up most of the rest. And then there was a little, little sliver called Other, and HP was in there. Uh, they had a hodgepodge of several different machines. They'd been forced into the computer business because the computers had become the controllers of the instruments. HP, famous for reliable instruments, was now faced with the situation where other people's controllers were failing all the time. And so they decided to build their own and that turned into a, a small um, 
the computer business with a real-time computer, business computer, uh, desktop computer, and so forth. So what they said to me was, how would you like to unify all of these in a single architecture and to build a computer research lab from scratch? We'll give you all of our, our growth resources and attrition for the next two years of research, about 250 new slots. And I said, well, that sounds pretty good, but uh, let me tell you about an idea I have about distributed computing. And I laid on them everything that IBM had told me not to talk about. And to my astonishment, they loved it. They said, oh my God, that's the, what the company has to do. That's our strategy. That's how we can make up for our late start. That's how we can become a player. That's the way to flatten the playing field. When can you start? And by the way, um, if you're successful, you'll replace the director of research for every, all the research, you know, whenever you get the job done. They didn't tell me what they would do if I wasn't successful, but I could mm -hmm. guess at that pretty well. So it was a really crazy risk. And uh, especially when I found out upon going home and resigning from IBM that I had already been appointed the vice president of research to replace Ralph Gomery, who was going on to a corporate position, and that was supposed to happen in the next couple of months. But I really liked the spirit and the energy and the confidence and the immense uh, engineering expertise at HP. And I said, what the hell? I hear the weather's good in California. Let's give it a shot. Go ahead. And so we moved. <laughs> and, and you ended up doing um, and, and initiating uh, uh, PA risk and a number of uh, uh, the former PA risk people are here today. Come uh, talk a little bit about that and how it was different in design and approach from A to one. I presume there were a lot of learnings from what worked, what didn't work at A to one. And kind of, I, I'm also sure. interested. What was kind of IBM's reaction to your doing PA risk? <laughs> <laughs> well, when I left IBM, even though I'd been there 15 years, uh, one of my tasks, one of my jobs, was I was so-called strategy monitor for computer systems for the annual plans that were created by the division. So I knew absolutely everything that was being done in HP and IBM, and I had to comment on it at an annual meeting. Um, to my surprise, I was called in for a meeting with Nicholas Katzenbach, former uh, Attorney General of the United mm -hmm. States, but then IBM's General Counsel. I hadn't met him before, rather formidable presence. And he sat me down and he said, listen, Birnbaum, we know you're not gonna steal our secrets. We'll put you in jail if you steal our people, but I'm here to talk to you about something else. He said, you're gonna get, you're gonna see a lot of things that IBM has invested a lot of energy in. Uh, and a lot of those are gonna be things that didn't work out, but it took us a long time to find out. And it is just as much a violation of your agreement to tell people what not to do as to tell them what to do. And I said, oh, I hadn't thought about that. So I got to HP and sure enough, uh, in the product divisions, they were doing all the wrong things. In fact, they were five years behind IBM, but treading down exactly the same path as ways of complex direct execution machines, high level machines, machines that supported a particular programming language. And I couldn't say anything. So I went to Bill Hewlett and I told him of my dilemma. And he said, well, he's right. You shouldn't say anything. He said, but let me uh, give you some advice. Ask questions. Don't give them the answers, just ask the questions. People are different. HP's got great people. You might get a pleasant surprise. So I would say things like, um, are you guys worried about the cash hit ratio? And uh, they hadn't been, but they went away and they were smart and they figured it out. And uh, to my great pleasure, um, they in some cases reinvented things that we had done in, in the 801 uh, with, with a twist. And in many other cases, the, the brilliant team that got assembled, people like Fred Luis and Ruby, who I understand are on the call, but Michael Mann, and Man. especially Bill Worley, and uh, many, many, Carol Hammond, Tony Lukes, uh, performance guy, many, many people. And they hired and got joined by other people, mostly young people just out of school, but in some cases, not so. We never hired any IBM people in the beginning part, except for Bill Worley who had been uh, associated remotely with the 801, but who in fact had uh, already left IBM. So I kept my mouth shut, I asked hard questions, and uh, we went to work and we did a lot of wonderful things. We built a good uh, global optimization group 
Uh, we proved that Unix could be used, not only as it ha was being used, but for real-time computing, online transaction processing. It could run COBOL. Um, we figured out how to do uh, high-speed scientific processing as well as real-time. We uh, built in the Multics model for rings of uh, privilege for security. We built in uh, hooks for full tolerance because we knew that would be a problem. But the main emphasis that we did, which we haven't even addressed at IBM, and which was the key question was, how do you transfer the people on the existing machines into the new machines? Did you have to rewrite every application program? My and pleasure. a young man named Dan Magenheimer said, let's, re let's reinvestigate object code translation, an old idea, but it blew up. But by applying the compiler optimization, et cetera, we wound up that we could run the old applications roughly twice as fast as they were running on their other machines and that we could do the translations in a few days, a critical step towards making this real. So we built a hardware prototype and we demonstrated tremendous advantages compared to what the divisions were doing. And we had a big meeting about it. And to my great despair, the HP executives, led by the CEO, John Young, looked at it and they said, well, wow, this is good work. We're going to give all you guys some stock options, but you know what? We're going to go with the divisions. And I said, oh my God, what? Again. not again. <laughs> what did I come to California for, for goodness sakes? What a fool. But unlike IBM, John Young was very clever. And he said, assume that they're going to fail. I want you to keep the team together, to add the manufacturing people you would need, to get some marketing people involved, and you guys be sitting in the wings ready if it fails the way you have told me you think it's going to. Well, it failed about a year later, and there we were. We transferred the team to Cupertino, and uh, we were in the risk business. About a thousand people were put together uh, to build the new systems, and that was how our PA risk got started. Um. Just, just kind of fast forwarding from PA risk. Um, you were a great champion. Uh, you know, you, you, you helped develop. You helped evangelize this notion of pervasive computing and, um, uh, I, I guess, uh, MC square. And 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 today, and and there are some questions which we'll ask later. But today, you see Internet of Things. You see smart devices. You see. Uh, wearables, you see edge computing, cloud computing, and, 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 and kind of talk to us a little bit about what was that vision and how did it come about? Okay, well, that's the quest I've been on, was on for 40 years, okay? Uh, instead of going back to HP after, I, I wound up heading the development for PA Risk eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, I went back Instead of going right back to the labs, I headed a group that you were part of that did the client server because I saw that as a necessary next step to create the utility in which the requesters of servers and the uh, providers of services could be distinct, but which would be connected by interfaces which would be defined by standards as the electric utility had been. So I had this idea that pervasive computers, and I have to distinguish that from ubiquitous computing, a term used by Mark Wegman and others uh, at uh, part. Pervasive means more noticeable by its absence than its presence, part of the everyday life of ordinary people, addressed by uh, easy to use un and understandable intuitive faces, and supported by an expensive infrastructure. For example, the automobile as a pervasive technology is supported by the road highway, inevitably catalyzes new industries like drive-in movies and uh, sub-dropping malls and so on. So pervasive computing, in my view, pervasive technologies go through four stages. They're uh, lab curiosities. They're used by, for specialized applications by people. They become manufacturing and commonplace, but they are not necessarily going to become pervasive. Dirigibles didn't, trolley cars didn't, quadraphonic sound didn't, and the list goes on and on. So I got back to the labs and I, um, had all this wonderful resource at my disposal. The labs had grown quite a bit larger. And I started a great many projects that had to do with user interface, with um, creating the kinds of what I called information appliances, appliances because they were named by what they did, they were a means to an end, that would use the new utility. 
And we started uh, working on all the aspects of this. We did many, many other things to broaden the scope of the labs, like going to life sciences, and so forth and so on, but we don't have time to talk about that. Um, things were good. The stock split two to one, five times. Uh, we were selling the uh, risk machines. Great, by the way, the reason it was called PA risk was because risk, unfortunately, had put on as a, a term, we were going to call it spectrum because that was the name of the project because it addressed the spectrum of application and the spectrum of sizes, but that turned out to be a trademark held by Clive Sinclair who wouldn't release it. I had one night to come up with it. We called it precision, precision architecture because it was based on such a vast array of measurements. Um, someone else had that one, so we called it PA risk, which was a pun for Palo Alto as well. Uh, anyway, in 1988, twin miracles occurred. I think two of the greatest things that happened in our civilization. Um, the World Wide Web came out of the nuclear physicists and Tim Berners-Lee at CERN, and shortly afterward, from a different group of nuclear people, uh, Netscape was invented, which produced the point and click style of using computers, the intuitive interface that everyone had been looking for. It took more years than most people think, but soon the internet was born, global information utility was there, and we created a program which for quite a number of years was the main strategy of HP called MC squared, uh, a poor pun, which stood for measurement, computing, and communication, the three core competencies of HP, one of only three companies in the world that had it. For example, IBM didn't have measurement, neither did DEC, et cetera, et cetera. And we set out to create the future by having a series of uh, important uh, three-day long meetings run by Barbara Waugh, our uh, indefatigable uh, personnel manager, or human resources manager, in which we invited the uh, R&D manager, the general manager, and the, um, uh, you know, uh, marketing manager of many divisions to come together to see how in combination they might invent new businesses like remote medicine, like many of the things that we see today. All of them featured measurement devices, sensors, actuators, the new global utility, and appliances. We started an appliance lab. We worked on it. It became the strategy for all of the company talked about it everywhere. I became the chief evangelist for MC squared and pervasive computing. Well, alas, it was not to be. Um, the big difference in all of this is that IBM is a systems company. It thinks in systems, it does, it merges the outputs of many divisions in a coordinated way, and it delivers a complete solution. To HP's DNA is products. Every tub on its own bottom, each group, being part of a, each, each division being part of a small group that specialize in something like medical electronics. Um, in order to ship PA risk, of course, we had to create systems divisions, but it wasn't really the way people thought. It wasn't part of the culture. And so our CEO, the late Lou Platt, insisted that any MC squared efforts needed to be funded from within the existing division budgets without relaxing them from their already have been placed profit targets. That means that, that the profit model is very complicated when you have multiple divisions, when some are providing a subsidiary role. Uh, and without a unifying leadership that would create the systems approach, uh, the product groups just weren't able to proceed. Uh, we had a big meeting to discuss this. A vote was taken and all members of the executive committee, except for me, voted to end MC Square, and the, the company went on to its own business. Sometime not too long after that, uh, it was proposed to spin off the measurement business, thereby guaranteeing that HP would have no advantage in MC Square, and sometimes after that, I retired, okay? I was asked to stay on as so-called chief scientist of uh, consulting With Carly Fiorina. Uh, with Carly Fiorina, <laughs> and, um, she began the process, which was completed by Mark Hurd later, of paying attention to cost targets, trying to please analysts and stockholders on a quarterly basis, eliminating projects that were too adventurous, and um, in addition, shrinking the research labs. They had been 1,500 people when I retired. I don't even know if they exist anymore, but they're down in a small number of hundreds. They cannot do anything without getting permission from a sponsoring product division 
and um, they can't do things that are, they couldn't do things that were longer than three years out. Mark Hurd was quoted, I don't know if he actually said this, as saying that innovation is not affordable by large companies whose job it is to create a staff to survey interesting developments in small companies and startups and then to buy them when they looked appropriate. Um, not my model. Um, I think we all know how HP has become eviscerated and uh, what was once one of the always top companies that everyone wanted to work for and always one of the most innovative companies uh, does not have that reputation with the exception of Agilent, the measurement part, which, was which continued the old ways and is just as strong and just as wonderful as it, has, as it always was. I, I want to give a chance to, there are lots of different questions and, and before I, I, I turn it over to, to them, maybe just a last question around sort of just uh, on the topic that you just mentioned, which is um, the role of research labs. You know, there's an incredible tradition of, of course, uh, IBM, HP, Park, uh, Siemens, Philips, uh, Bell Labs, uh, uh, where, where you had kind of uh, a very significant fundamental research being done in corporations. And how do you see that uh, going forward, you know, you, uh, in, in, in the corporation? Okay, well, great question. Um, Research labs, in my view, serve several key roles. It doesn't matter if they're decentralized, distributed. It doesn't matter if you call them applied research or advanced development. Uh, and it's largely independent, I think, of the management style as well. They enable the very easy integration of different skills, different disciplines, different parts of the company, uh, and different outlooks. And that makes disruptive possibilities far easier than they can ever be uh, in a set of product divisions that are facing schedule and profit pressure. Uh, the other thing that is true is that a, re a failure in research, a failure to reach, reach an objective, is not really a failure because if you know why you failed, it stops the company from going down a trail that will probably be 10 times as expensive and consume valuable resources for years. Uh, sometimes the best work comes when a, a solution in one field is applied to another and companies can find many ways to do that. We, we did a lot of imaginative things to make that true. Um, I think today, with so many wonderful new technologies emerging, uh, they go in, many go under the general rubric of AI, as you know, but I'm talking about machine learning and big data and neural computing and uh, all the uh, life sciences stuff with uh, genetics and, uh, and DNA. The opportunities for combination are fantastic. The Internet of Things, which is really exactly MC squared, I once uh, gave a talk at Intel and uh, Tannenbaum heard it and he said, oh, I see, it's like an Internet of Things and that's what stuck. Of course, our global utility became the cloud. We weren't smart enough to call it that. Our division, which was 10 years ahead of its time, was called the Computer Utility uh, Division. And um, my hope is that this is going to continue. They say that the uh, IoT is going to be a couple of trillion dollars uh, sometime in the middle of this decade. And uh, in all of those things, I, I hope that these ideas that I help to evangelize of the pervasive computing will, will be remembered and that there'll be something uh, a little bit more to look forward to than uh, Twitter and Facebook. Yes. <laughs> so we're going to uh, turn it over to the audience. There are a lot of questions, and I, I want to apologize in advance to to the questioners you know we have about 10 15 minutes i think we can take for questions so we'll get to as many as we can and please kind of uh, uh, be brief um, um, uh, my colleague matty will as I announced the names will will enable you to kind of ask your question but also uh, give us your name and your your affiliation and maybe connection to to joel and so maybe we'll start with ken pivak Ken? Uh, Maddie, do you want to enable Ken to, to Ken, ask the question? Can you hear me? Hello? Go ahead, Ken. Oh, you can hear me? Yes. Oh. Hello, Ken. Oh, how are you? Hi, Joel. Um, so, Joel, I wanted to ask you briefly, um, you always had some wonderful stories about the analogies you, you've explained. Uh, very complicated things in simple form. So my question was, what, what is the best aha moment you saw somebody who 
it, the light bulb clicked um, for something that you were trying to explain, whether they were in the industry or not? Well, that's hard. It's always hard to know when people understand things. I think I spent a good part of my life uh, creating comic strip bubbles in which I would try to get an analogy as accurate as I could to describe it to an executive who, or someone who wasn't technical. Um, I, I guess I think that uh, probably the pervasive computing is the best thing I ever got to. Mo most people really got the idea. Uh, and I say that the best one that I think I ever did was when I thought of uh, this example. I, um, I said, if you want to know about a pervasive technology, think about electric motors. Uh, they are pervasive and nobody knows how many they own, probably within a factor of two or three, because you don't think of them as electric motors. You don't know how many are in your washing machine or in your car or in your home, and they're all different and they're all specialized and there are many different companies and there are many different ways to do it, but because they're pervasive, they're part of everyday life for ordinary people and we would be devastated if they went away. Cell phone, uh, today, smartphone, has become another example of that. Thank you. Thank, thank you. We'll take um, the next question, Harry Petreski. Hello, Harry. Um, I just unmuted. Hi, Joel. I, can Hello, you hear Harry. me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, great. Uh, I want to thank you for making uh, technology understandable to a technologically cha uh, challenged layperson. Joel and I were classmates at Cornell, fraternity brothers, did lots of things together. But what I wanted to ask you is what is your most memorable accomplishment as a pitcher on the Cornell baseball team? <laughs> Just want to let people know that you're an athlete as well as a scholar. Well, I, I was, uh, I guess in my senior year, I had a pretty, pretty good record. But the, um, the best game I, in my mind was uh, pitching at uh, West Point because my five athletically oriented uh, uncles and father came to the game. And uh, one of the people I had to pitch against was uh, a guy who had been the Heisman Trophy winner. He was a far better football player than uh, baseball. But I did pitch a, a quite good game. It was my last game or next last game. And uh, we won that, and um, I, I got a, a smidgen of respect for my uncles at last. <laughs> Thank you. And, and we'll, we'll take the next question from Fred Luis. Uh-oh, Fred is very smart. I think I'm in trouble. <laughs> okay, Fred. Hi. I'm going to say something nice to you, Joel, which is that I enjoyed working with you. And I just wanted to comment that in, in addition to all the technical qualities we've been discussing, you had one unique personal quality, which I valued very much, which was you were, you were always gentlemanly and nice to people. But I always went away from a critical meeting with you knowing I either got patted on the head or got spanked. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been accused of not suffering fools gladly, but I don't remember ever spanking you, Fred. Fred was in charge of a lot of the most critical parts of our IO and then was a key, key leader in the uh, client cyber architecture and uh, uh, in both his career at uh, IBM long before, not part of the uh, 801 effort. And, and afterwards, uh, he, he's one of the giants uh, that I've ever worked with. So thanks for the compliment, Fred. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and the next question we have is uh, from Dave O, who I guess worked with you at, at Yorktown Heights. I'm sorry, I didn't hear who it was. Uh, Dave, and I don't know his last name. It's oh. just Dave O. Let's, let's see if, and if he doesn't come on, I'll ask his question for him. Ravi, I think Dave has left the chat. I can't find him. We'll, we'll skip him because there's so, so many questions. Probably, probably went to see a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> After what you said, <laughs> uh, uh, we'll, we'll next go to Seem, who, uh, uh, who's asking a, a question here about uh, uh, IBM and HP. Go ahead, Mohan. Yeah. Hi, Joel. You won't remember me. I interviewed with you in October 1981 as I was graduating from UT Austin. And I asked the same question that um, 
because Ravi asked you, you know, why would you leave Yorktown and go to, of all places, HP Labs? In any case, I wound up uh, ultimately joining uh, IBM Research in December 81, just retired after 38 and a half years. Um, and um, my question is, uh, I'm sure you've been following what's been going on with IBM. So what do you think went right, what went wrong, and um, what would you suggest as future things? Well, I'm, I'm not terribly informed, but uh, I, I think IBM handled this whole, you know, their difficult period, uh, part of which was caused by HP, actually. And, uh, you know, the uh, once, uh, they got the new leadership and restructured, and gee, I, I think they've handled the transition fabulously. I think IBM Research, I haven't been there, I don't know many people from there, but they seem to be doing wonderful things, uh, all the work with Watson and everything else, and right, right on top of uh, all the most important technologies and still making basic contributions. So uh, IBM seems to have done what I wish uh, HP would have done, and I, again, I, I guess it's uh, what's ingrained in you and it has something to do, a lot to do with the leadership. But uh, from what I can tell, uh, Yorktown and, and the, the other labs, um, Santa Teresa and Zurich and so on, are, are just as uh, productive and just as important as they used to be. And I think they have a, probably a much better record of transferring technology now. But you're not concerned about the reduction in um, revenues and all that, that's been a big problem for the last two, eight, nine years. Well, I'm, I'm not concerned about it because I'm not informed about it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know enough about it to comment. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. We'll next go to Conrad Nankin, who, who, who's kind of, um, Conrad, if you're there, please ask your question. Otherwise, I'll ask it. It's a good question. Oh, uh, hi, Joel. Hello, Conrad. Hi. Uh, well, uh, this is sort of a general question, but you're so brilliant, I'd love to hear the answer. Uh, looking uh, toward the future, what are the important scientific research matters and or technologies uh, that ought to be being pursued that are either not being pursued or more likely should be given more support? Gosh, that's a hard question. And again, I'm not, uh, I don't have a lot of, I, I think that we're working on an awful lot of the right things right now. And I think that uh, what, what people call AI, and which is a, a bad term for a lot of the things that are going on, is going to really make computers usable by everybody in very much better and more interesting ways. I think we're gonna be able to revisit data that was taken long ago and mine new information from it. I think that um, the, rate of uh, invention in almost any field, especially across fields, will be so much greater because of the tremendous communication links that we've uh, all got access to these days. So in, in things that I guess people work, would work on a little bit more, I, I guess uh, the, the thing I focused on in my last year or so at HP Labs was uh, really getting started a quantum stru uh, structures, well, I did that before that, a quantum structures research institute for quantum computing. Many, many people are working on it. It's an enormously difficult problem, and it's not clear that it will ever have any general applicability, but a lot of people think it will, and I, I hope we will just pour tremendous energy into that because it will change everything if that takes place. Things like um, large-scale computations like for weather prediction and so on will become immensely better. And cheaper. Uh, another area that I, I wish people would work more on is life sciences. I think, again, there's a tremendous amount of that, but I think there's a, a huge amount of uh, synergy that hasn't been fully exploited yet between the computational sciences and the people who uh, uh, do uh, drug development and um, medical procedures in general. And, uh, again, I think lots of people are working on it, but I, I wish it were. Um, a little less proprietary effort than it is today, and I wish that some standards would emerge. Uh, the ability to treat people individually through their gene a genomic profile has existed for a long time, and yet we don't see that happening in doctor's offices, so that drugs could be prescribed specifically for a, a particular person in a particular situation. Uh, in fact, we invented a solution that used an inkjet computer to print those chips, in which we use the four bases of DNA instead of the four colors of ink 
in order to make those chips. And yet I, I don't see anything like that happening and I wish that it would. I, I'm sure there's a much longer list. Uh, David wow. asks a question which you just answered. Uh, I think <laughs> I'll answer for you, which is what do you feel would be the most impactful technology for society in 2035? So I'll, I'll take it as kind of health, you know, the impact on our health and personalized medicine and genomics and, and all the things we talked about. In, uh, in 1997, I was one of the speakers at the 50th anniversary of ENIAC, so-called What Will the Next Fits on the, it's on, the whole thing is on the web if you haven't, it's on the uh, YouTube if you haven't seen it. And I was asked to talk about alternative computing in which I covered uh, quantum computing, biological computing, and optical computing. And from that, I concluded that uh, we would always do computing with electrons and we'd always do communication with photons because of the difference in the uh, electromagnetic and the optical um, binding forces. And I really felt that the one of those that really ought to win if we could only figure out how to deal with quantum entanglement and so forth was the, um, the quantum computing. And if we ever can get a good handle on that, produce a few qubits that you can really use, wow, uh, we're not gonna recognize what we're able to do anymore. We'll take two more questions. So I'll, I'll start with uh, Ruby Lee. Um, Ruby, can you ask a question? Hello, Ruby. Hi, Joel. Good to see you again. <laughs> uh, I wanted to thank you very much for being a real visionary leader when you were guiding research at HP Labs. Um, I remember that uh, you were always excited new ideas and I also remember you hiring me the day I came to interview at HP Labs before I got home there was a call that I was hired um, but it was so much fun to work on the PA risk project uh, at HP my very first industrial job um, I wanted to ask you uh, since we've already talked about your ideas of future technology, to take a look at retrospectively from the 10,000 foot level at what you think might be the long-term impact of risk architecture and maybe PA risk in particular on not just the computing industry but the whole landscape of computing and communications well and ruby you were always one of the smartest people at hp labs and one of the most uh, important contributors to our project then and even later when you went to the divisions we had a rule at uh with the pa risk that uh if you wanted to add a new instruction it had to be used as you know, at least as much as, if, if you had 100 instructions and you added 100 and first, it better be used about 1% of the time. And uh, Ruby not only added an instruction, she added a whole instruction set uh, for graphics, which uh, became uh, very successful and very popular. I could count on you to ask the most difficult question, Ruby. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I, I, I guess uh, this whole experience has been painful enough to me that I haven't kept up with it so much. I, I know about the uh, risk five what's happened you may remember that we had the idea early on that really be a utility and we uh, standards were the most important thing and first we wanted to be able to, to, to compose the software to make unix an open software platform so that anybody could uh, use it think about a utility uh, you don't if you think about electricity the plug in the wall standard guarantees that you don't have to worry about how the electricity is generated. You, you don't know, you don't care. Uh, and you also don't care what you plug in. As long as you obey the standard, everything behind the wall and everything in front of the wall will work together, even if it wasn't designed to do so. And we thought how wonderful if the world could get that way. And so I was one of the people that helped to get the open software foundation started. We took the guy who was the head of our, um, a software laboratory, it's Ira Goldstein, became their first head of research, and um, that moved forward. And out of that, eventually, uh, came Linux. Uh, now we have a hardware activity that was not possible in our day because of the fact that most of the proprietary advantage came from the chip technologies and the way in which you implemented them. 
Uh, these have become a tiny fraction of system cost and uh, basically a, almost a commodity. So I see what's happened in, uh, you know, with the ARM and with many others. Uh, I, th I think even the Intel machines have a very much larger percentage of risk philosophy in them because risk is a philosophy and it's the right way to build a machine. And uh, depending on how you do it, it's the right trade-off of hardware and software to optimize the total value and throughput of the system. So I don't think it can go away. I think it's at the heart of what goes forward. Uh, I'm not sure there'll ever be a risk quantum computer, but uh, I think as long as people build computers, the ideas of John Kahn and the newer ideas of all the people in all the companies that have worked on risk uh, since then are going to be a, a, a desired way. Think, think about when people were building machines with instruction sets of several hundred enormously complex instructions, you know, dim the lights, flush the toilets, uh, lock the doors kind of instructions. And uh, you know, nobody does that anymore. You compose the complicated ones out of the simple ones. And that's the way I think to do it. So I'm, I'm very proud that risk is uh, so uh, pervasive. And I think that uh, if the uh, risk cooperatives can make the hardware open as the software guys have done, uh, we're in for a lot of wonderful things up ahead, uh, which will take much less time and money to develop. We have time for a last audience question. And, and so uh, Deepak Bhagat, if, uh, if you can ask a question. So, so th there was a new shiny kind of object, uh, which was sun and many people left from HP to sun and, and Deepak was one of them. Go ahead, Deepak. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh -huh. uh, hi, Joel. Uh, it was a pleasure working in your organization. Uh, even though I was many levels below you, I was part of the HPE operating system, uh, which later on was called MPXL. Initially, it was written for the vision architecture, which was a capability-based architecture, but then PA Risk nuked it, and we ended up porting it to uh, uh, PA Risk. So the kind of learning I had from you and Bill Worley and Fred Louise was so much, you know, it was, it was like I was very fortunate to be part of it. And, and then once you folks left uh, in 88, I left ITG and then started the Intel program 386, 486. And I used some of the management tactics and the kind of questions you asked, used to ask, and helped create the first SVR 4.0, uh, you know, unique solution for HP, actually, which later on became a very big business unit. But then I think the most important contribution I made in my career was as a result of learning from all of you, which was at Sun Microsystem when I co-led the uh, transition to their 64-bit Solaris UltraSpark, which became one of the most successful product line and enabled their stocks uh, to split five times. It was there for 13 years, grid computing, network security, and others. For right now, I'm at SAP, essentially one of the key leaders there in designing our own private cloud to compete against uh, the public cloud, the hyperscaler. So my question is in context of how should we compete against hyperscalers considering the cost advantages are not in our favor? I'm sorry, I'm, I don't have a very good connection here. I didn't hear that question so clearly. Could you repeat it? Or Ravi, did you hear it? And could you yeah, I, I, I did. And, and, um, uh, and Deepak, correct me if I'm not stating this. You know, you have sort of uh, amazing scale with the cloud that Google and Microsoft and Amazon and all are bringing. And Deepak, is your question, uh, what's your question related to them? So my question is, how do we, the, the private cloud designers, compete against the hyperscalers? How do you compete against Google and Amazon? And, and AWS, right, and Microsoft. Well, I, I don't know in, in detail how to answer that. But I would say that the general answer I would give is that when you're up against somebody who's a lot bigger and a lot richer than you are, you got to figure out some way that being small and flexible and able to move quickly turns into an advantage. So when you talk about the cloud, uh, you know, the reason it got called the cloud, I suppose, is because I and all the other people who were talking about the information utility, not knowing what else to do, we drew a cloud on a slide and we drew arrows into it. But of course, it's not that simple. There's all kinds of structure in there. There are different ways to do computing in there. 
and there are m many, many opportunities to uh, create either a unique design or perhaps a unique technology within that technology that would in one way or another uh, produce a, a performance and advantage. Uh, security is awfully important these days and uh, it's awfully lousy. And uh, maybe there's some way, uh, uh, security really needs to be designed in from the, be from the beginning, of course, but not having that opportunity, perhaps there's some way to, uh, to figure out a way to make it more secure, more robust. Uh, one of the problems with the internet, as we're seeing in these strange and perilous times, it, uh, it tends to collapse under the, uh, the uh, heavy uses, let alone the uh, malware and other things that people use to, to create attacks on it. So I, I would say look for something that the big guys either don't think is important enough or uh, wouldn't do or haven't realized yet. If you go head to head doing the same thing that they do, um, well, you can uh, wish it. you a lot of luck, but you're <laughs> unlikely to be successful. Uh, anyway, yeah. th thanks, thanks for the nice words. I, I don't remember meeting you, but I, I'm sure you made uh, important contributions uh, yeah. to the uh, work at HP. I worked uh, mostly with week, Joel and uh, with uh, Fred Lewis. Yeah, Joel, as we, as we conclude, um, uh, what, uh, what are you kind of proudest off in your career, your long career with such, you know, accomplishments and what's your greatest regret? Oh, my greatest regret. All right. Well, uh, I don't know what I'm the proudest of. I, I, I guess uh, I think I was uh, a, a little bit of a mentor to a lot of people who, who did wonderful work and who went on in many cases to have later careers or do other things, and I, I'm always proud of that. I won't name any specifics, but, but I guess if you want one thing that made me feel really good, um, somebody in HP, not us, uh, decided uh, the last year I was there, I retired in February 99, they looked at 1998 and they, um, they did a survey of all of HP's revenue, and uh, they said, uh, did this product line originate or did the innovation in this product line that made it successful originate in HP labs? In other words, was it something which got transferred? And um, amazingly, I don't know how accurate the number was, but I never questioned it because I liked it a lot. Um, it was 78%. Wow. So, you know, the ink, of, of course, that doesn't mean that's your thing that they're doing, but you do the inkjet invention and prototype and so on, and then you help make it better, you get credit for the inkjet. And that number was about five times to six times of any other company at the time, uh, because we, we tracked that. And I got visits from people that were the heads of Bell Labs and Xerox and so forth and so on to find out how we did this. And uh, it wasn't because of me and it wasn't because of anything special. It was because of the culture in HP that had been created by Hewlett and Packard and John Young after them that people were fungible. You move them about the company to make things come out right. And there wasn't anything special about a research guy or a manufacturing guy or a marketing person. You just put the teams that you needed to get the job done and you treated people with dignity and respect. Uh, all of that, of course, has been eviscerated and sabotaged and uh, except and I, I don't really know about the printer part of HP, but if you look at the enterprise part of HP, my goodness, it's uh, entirely unrecognizable. So I'm, I'm very proud of, uh, of that number. My greatest regret, I often, um, well, I'm gonna tell you something else that I had never said publicly before. Um, when John Young uh, left the company, they were looking for a CEO and they had one person that they really wanted. His name was Dick Hackborn. He was a wonderful guy who had been involved in our computer business and who had created the printer business for HP and this business. And uh, Hewlett and Packard and everyone put a full court press to get Dick Hackborn to take the job. He didn't want it. He wanted to retire early. He wanted to spend time with his family. No matter what they did, he wouldn't accept the job. So they started looking around and HP's tradition was to hire from within. And Dave Packard uh, offered me the job of CEO of HP. And um, gosh, uh, I didn't feel at all qualified for it. I never took a business course. I uh, couldn't have made it on any audit committee. 
Uh, I hardly ever built more than one of anything in my life to lead development experience. And I got out of that when I started manufacturing. And in addition to that, I had uh, not spent a lot of time with my family and I'd been diagnosed with heart disease. And it just, so I came in on a Monday morning and I said, sorry, Dave. Okay. So sometimes um, when I'm by myself, I wonder what would have happened if I had said yes. And could I somehow have kept the old traditions going better than uh, what turned out yeah, to happen? Look at, look at Microsoft, Facebook, Google, um, and IBM following. They all have technology uh, kind of experts as leaders. Uh, Joel, it's been an incredible pleasure to host you today. Um, you have inspired me, but everyone else here. So thank you. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad to have been part of uh, your Dinosaurs of Technology series. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.